Thank you very much for tuning in. This video is gonna be about Wirecard. So Wirecard obviously was this huge fraud from Germany, embarrassingly, and it was a financial fraud where they claimed to have a system where they're basically an intermediary between online payments. They were basically a payment processor, but they made up most of the numbers. And there were a lot of short sellers that kind of figured this out long before, but the government was protecting them, the industry was protecting them, and everybody was kind of just believing the CEO and believing the company. It was like too big to fail. It seemed like this couldn't be a fraud, it's too big. So what I, as you know, always like to do is I like to go back to interviews where they either have a normal interview talking about the industry or they're actually being critically assessed. They're basically getting very difficult questions and they're answering to those questions. And luckily, so the CEO is Marcus Brown and he's actually in a position where he's going to be asked about fraud allegations. This is right after I think the Financial Times released some articles because they realized the regulators aren't doing anything. They're even protecting them. They protected their business from short sellers. Short sellers are basically betting on the stock price going down. So if they find a company that they think is fraudulent and they think is completely overvalued, then they're short selling the company. And if it goes down, they make a lot of money. If it goes up, they lose a lot of money. So short sellers are the opposite of normal stock trading, basically. So the regulator actually prohibited short selling because they thought it was unwarranted and unfair, which I think at the time was completely unprecedented in Germany that this would happen. Okay, let, let's get right into the interviews. I got four clips prepared of the same interview and, and let's get into it. Where do you get the kind of growth that you have as a German company doing wireless payments? Uh, first of all, by going global. So uh, we were an early event in regions where digital payments uh, was adopted much more early. But um, we also see a huge pickup now also in continental Europe and especially also Germany. So many big German companies are now strongly also going for digital. They are trying to unify their sales channels over one digital stack. So I'm very optimistic that also the large uh, German corporations are going into this direction. We're helping them on this path. Mm. He kind of, look, he looks a bit crazy, which is fine. There, there's an interview of Jeff Bezos where he looks crazy because he has the big eyes, but obviously. What I find kind of interesting about him, this is a small detail. By the way, he's in jail now, but this is kind of a small detail. He kind of has these cold eyes and a smile. He's like this, 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 this uh, non-empathetic smile where this, his eyes look dead and then he just raises his, his mouth by keeping his eyes big. So he got that. So, so this is kind of always weird because, I mean, the interviewer definitely notices that. It's like very distant and uh, very, very deceptive. I wouldn't really say that this is a bad, I mean, it's a bad trait, but I wouldn't say that this is any red flag at all. Like there's a lot of people who are like that. It doesn't mean that they're all frauds. It's just maybe the, the way he carries himself. Maybe he's a very distant person, which I think he is based on the interviews of his employees. Next one. Let's get right into the controversies. So now it comes about the article and now, okay, what are you doing with the fraud allegations? And this is super interesting. The, the scandals uh, that we've seen in the stock market. I mean, it's interesting because on the one hand, you have 23 buy ratings from analysts out of the 29 that I, that I counted on the Bloomberg today. On the other hand, there seems to be a nonstop controversy coming from the Financial Times, SIRF, and a number of other places that create the kind of volatility I don't think German investors are, are used to. Why is that there's so much controversy surrounding your company? Yeah, let me first say, since going public, in 2005, I think we delivered uh, an average share price growth every year of 36%. So I think we have been very successful also in share price development terms. So, so first of all, uh, I mean, he, he talked about a lot of things. So the interviewer actually set up the question very broadly. But in the end, he says, okay, why do you have all these fraud allegations? This is the question he asked at the end. And then Marcus Brown, he's kind of expanding and saying, let me say first that we have been successful because our share price has been growing. So first of all, the share price is the valuation. The share price doesn't have to reflect the worth of the company. It's just what people think. You can see, for example, during the coronavirus epidemic, the, the stock market just went down. You can see it. Just look at that specific time. Look at Tesla, look at public companies. A lot of them go down, then they go up again. It was like a shock. The company value didn't change at all. Like during that specific time, when you have like such a huge shift, the value of the company doesn't change. It's the valuation that changes. The valuation in the eyes of random faceless investors. They're suddenly selling 
stock price goes down, whatever. For him as a CEO to equate the stock price as his success is kind of strange. Shows how much he's relying on investors or how much he's focusing on his investors. Obviously, this is also important, but I find it very telling that he doesn't directly answer the question. He goes into this weird, like we work, like Nicola, they're all talking just about the stock price and not talking about what the interview is actually asking about. Um, and if you look into our new sales, we had in the second half year of uh, 2018, new sales was up by nearly 160%. So we signed in the second half year 32 billion of new volume. This is so funny. He talks about 30 billion of new volume. So just for a little bit of context, this was actually made up. They made up the books. So what they did is they bought up a lot of companies in Asia. And then these companies in Asia, which was a very strange decision anyway. So the short sellers saw that and saw, this is kind of weird. They bought these companies and had these companies create fraudulent books. And then they claimed that, oh, we have so many revenues, so many transactions from Asia. And this is how they were validating that. And yeah, so what he's saying now is, is pretty much made up. And he knows that it's made up. That uh, compares to about 12 billion in the same period last year. So I think we have a tremendous growth development before us. Uh, we have big innovations before us. So this is what we concentrate on. Uh, I do not too much look into controversies, but my message is I think we're, we're, we have a very strong year before us. Uh, we concentrate on technology innovation. Let's go to the next one, which is about know your customer. So obviously money laundering is something they've been accused of because it's so, so they started out the business with pornography and online betting, so online gambling. These were the only industries that actually did online payments. So they were very heavily involved in that. And they were accused of also doing, let's say money laundering for organized crime and stuff like that. So now he's talking about KYC, which is know your customer. And how are you basically making sure that compliance is there, especially in Asia, but also, I mean, in Germany and in Europe. So how is he focusing on that? What I like is that now he's doing the Elizabeth Holmes, which is the using big words that are very unspecific in order to avoid the question. So instead of answering the question, he uses, as you will see, he uses words to string them together that it sounds like he answered even though he did. Have you got someone new in charge of compliance? Have you got someone new in charge of, you know, know your customer dealing with or stopping money laundering sort of before it happens? I think it's a, a strong USP of our card that we have always started already 17, 18 years to invest in a very strong real-time compliance process. We can today really, in a real-time digital process, sign up globally merchants uh, in a very strong and robust compliant way. So I would see the exactly uh, or I have a different view here. I think it's a strong USP for us that we're heavily investing there constantly and that we can today act on all five continents. We can really deliver uh, with strong scalable processes on all five continents, not only in Asia, but we are now also active in North America, in South America, in Africa, in Australia, New Zealand. So I would say uh, risk management and compliance in relation to very innovative processes is one of our absolute strengths. He didn't, he didn't really say anything at all. How do you show compliance? Real-time compliance, USP, which are unique selling points. We are in all these countries. This is an advantage for us, blah, blah, blah. We have always been working on that. So he didn't answer the question. He just used keywords. He used keywords, strung them together, and then it sounded like he was answering the question, but he did This is what Elizabeth Holmes would have done. She probably wouldn't have said that, oh, this is a huge advantage for us. She wouldn't have been that personal. Elizabeth Holmes would have been far less personal in the answer. She would have deflected more and talked about a big vision as if she was in the room as she was saying it he is really in the room as he's saying it but he, he almost seems like her which is really funny because they were both wearing the turtlenecks so if, if you look at the the pictures they're both wearing turtlenecks which is kind of funny they both have like these big crazy eyes so the next one is going to be about transparency so with all these companies the investors want more transparency because investors aren't stupid they realize something is fishy the problem is that they have so much on their board and, and maybe sometimes they're just seduced by someone but they are now so the question is now how are you handling the information you share with your investors how are you handling transparency and keeping them happy 
Are you, do you think sharing enough with them as far as transparency is concerned when it comes to acquisitions, when it comes to customer onboarding? You've got your shareholder meeting uh, next week. So uh, I think we constantly increase also our reporting or we constantly develop our reporting. If you compare, let's say, our reporting 2008 to what we uh, are disclosing in 2018 for our full year uh, reporting 2018, I think also there uh, we are uh, much more advanced than uh, many of our peers. So we are completely disclosing what do we do with organic. So for example, in Q1 now we had an organic revenue growth of 32%. I have to pause. I mean, watching him is kind of uncomfortable. It's it's kind of like, <laughs> yes, he's his crazy eyes and it feels like he is being nice, but he's also attacking, if that makes sense. It feels like he's kind of attacking in the subtext, like he's attacking with his eyes. It's like he's murdering him with his eyes while he's like trying to say it's like almost his face looks like stop asking me questions, ask me something nice. Like he looks like in a weird way aggressive, even though he's calm, it's kind of strange. I don't know what's going on there. This was our best quarter, uh, a real record quarter. Um, so we're disclosing what we do organic, what we do with historic M&A. Uh, going forward, we don't see M&A as an important part for Wirecard. So we're currently very much concentrate on organic growth. Uh, we are currently rolling out Wirecard platform globally in all geographies where we are currently active uh, and this is what we concentrate on but there's a clear commitment of course to constantly also increase uh, our and to further develop our report yeah so he didn't really answer he just said it's getting better since when they started which is great obviously things should get better but it doesn't really address the point okay are you transparent with your investors so m a merger and acquisitions so basically buying up companies or merging with companies what he's now saying oh this is actually not as relevant one organic growth but obviously this then became the major cover-up strategy where they bought companies in Asia at like India and stuff like that and then they used them to forge the books and they justified that by saying that they already have the infrastructure in the country so they just bought them up but the short sellers realized that this didn't make any sense what I find interesting is that I didn't really expect that much of a red flag but man he's like just personality wise I think you can really see that this man has a very strange personality. You can see by the way he answers. It's like, if you listen to a lot of entrepreneurs, they are usually more happy to talk about their technology. They're very happy to talk about their technology. Just the same word flag as with Elizabeth Holmes. She didn't talk about her technology. If you create a technology like that, you can't shut up about it. If this was an actual CEO of a company who actually has that type of technology, he would be bragging about his customers, bragging about the payments, bragging about who uses it, how many people use it. He would tell an anecdote of, yeah, we have 50% of our sales actually are in Asia and we have these people, they have a smartphone there and they're actually using these payments every day. And I went there and I saw the people, we had an event, it was great. This is an actual CEO. They, they will be that involved. They will be that happy. In the end, just trying to manage your investors doesn't really work because your investors do not necessarily want you to talk to them. They want you to talk about your business. The investors want to see you doing great things with your business. They don't want to be managed by you. They want you to manage your company and brag about the results. That's what they want. But what he's doing is he's managing the investors, trying to tell them what they want to hear. So it's really, really fishy. Yeah. And that's about it. I found it very instructive. Thank you very much for watching and see you in the next video.